as stuck. The Egyptian pharaoh Amasis was friends with the Greeks and also tried to stay on the right side of the Persians. When he heard that their king Cambyses had problems with his eyesight, he sent an Egyptian eye doctor to help him out. This doctor really did not want to leave his family behind in Egypt, and so he had a grudge against Amasis. When he arrived in Persia, he suggested that Cambyses should marry the daughter of Amasis. Often in the past, ruling families from different countries have married their children to one another in the spirit of peace. The theory runs that it's harder to go to war against your own in-laws. According to Herodotus, Amasis really did not want to part with his daughter and send her so far away. If she went to live in Persia, he would never see her again, and he wasn't sure that Cambyses would treat her right. So he came up with a trick. There was a beautiful girl in his court who was the daughter of the previous pharaoh, Apries. Amasis had rebelled against Apries, kicked him off the throne, and taken his place. So he sent the daughter of Apries to Cambyses, saying that she was his own. But when she arrived, she told Cambyses the truth, that Amasis had tricked him. Cambyses flew into a rage and decided to conquer Egypt as a matter of revenge. Cambyses' plans for war faced a great obstacle: the desert. He had to march his army across the hot sands where there was little or no water. He only succeeded because the Arabs of the desert helped him. Herodotus suggests they provided water in long pipes made of animal skins. So the great Persian army that included captives and Greeks and Lydians marched across the sands of what Herodotus names as the district of Syria called Palestine. Today, that would include Israel. While the Persians were on the way, Amasis died, and his son took over. His name was Psammetichus. Soon after Psammetichus became pharaoh, an extraordinary weather event took place. It rained in the Egyptian city of Memphis, where rain had never been seen before. Apparently, this was a bad omen. An omen is a sign from the gods that something momentous is about to happen, and it did. The Persians conquered Egypt and much of North Africa. It was the year 525 BC. So now the Persian king Cambyses ruled Egypt, and the independence of that ancient and mysterious and beautiful and amazing country came to an end. The first thing the new king did was to try and humiliate Psammetichus, something his more generous father Cyrus would not have done. He made Psammetichus watch a parade with his own daughter dressed as a slave girl carrying water. Psammetichus watched in silence and did not shed a tear. Then he made him watch the young noble boys of Egypt, including his own son, being marched away to be executed. Still, Psammetichus showed no emotion. Then, at last, an old friend, now reduced to poverty, came and begged Psammetichus for food. Finally, the conquered pharaoh shed some tears. Cambyses was intrigued and asked him why he had cried for a friend and not for his son and daughter. And Psammetichus replied that the first two events were so tragic. That nothing, not even tears, could express how he felt. But the sight of an old comrade reduced to poverty was a fitting occasion to weep. Next, he set his sights on conquering other parts of Africa, including Ethiopia. Ethiopia had an almost magical reputation. For example, it was known to have the place called the Table of the Sun, where the gods made food appear every day to feed the poor. The Ethiopians were known as the tallest and most beautiful people in the world, and the way they chose their king was unique. They picked the tallest and strongest among them to be their ruler. Cambyses was very intrigued by the tales of mystical Ethiopia, 
and he sent his spies to the country to gather information. The people he chose for the task were called the fish eaters. They came from the southernmost part of Egypt and spoke the same language as the Ethiopians. Cambyses sent these fish eaters with gifts for the Ethiopian king. The first gift they gave to the Ethiopian king was a gold bracelet. He was very surprised because he thought it was a chain to hold a prisoner. Fortunately, they soon discovered the source of the misunderstanding. The Ethiopians were so rich that they used gold to chain prisoners. Then they gave him some expensive perfume called myrrh. You might recognise these gifts from the Bible, gold, frankincense and myrrh. They were the most classy gifts of the times. The Ethiopian king was not at all impressed. He showed them a spring of delicate water that smelled of lavender. All the Ethiopians washed daily in that spring and it made them sweet-smelling and shiny-skinned. So why would they need an expensive perfume called myrrh? Next, the fish-eaters gave the Ethiopian king some wine. He tried a sip and said, Well, at least this stuff is good. The king realised that the gifts were not a sincere sign of friendship. The Persian king has sent you here as spies, he declared. And then he asked the fish-eaters about the Persians. How tall are they? How long do they live? What do they eat? They replied that the Persians ate bread and lived for up to 80 years at the most. Oh, that's pathetic, replied the Ethiopian king. We eat far better and we live for 120 years. He sent them back with a huge bow and arrow, saying, When your Persians can draw this bow and fire an arrow from it, only then should they even think about making war against a people who are far stronger and better than they are. I just might mention that powerful bows that are hard to draw are a feature of several stories, including Odysseus in the Odyssey and the Ramayana, an Indian story. The fish-eaters reported all this to Cambyses, who was quite predictably furious and decided to attack the Ethiopians right away. He took his army and started to march south through the Sahara Desert. He was in such a rush that this time he didn't take any advance precautions. It was a bad idea. The Persians soon ran out of food and water, and the soldiers began to eat one another. Cambyses gave up and returned to Egypt. When he arrived back in Memphis, the festival of the bull god Apis was taking place. During this time, the Egyptian priests dressed up a bull and led him through the streets, and all the people cheered and clapped and danced and sang and took part in the celebrations. It was a special bull, mostly black, but with a white diamond on its forehead, the mark of an eagle on its back, and the mark of a beetle on its tongue. The Egyptians believed that he was the incarnation of their god, Apis, himself. Cambyses heard all the wild partying and noise and thought the Egyptians were celebrating his failure. He was so angry that he threw a spear at the bull god and wounded it. Eventually, it died. According to the Egyptians, the gods punished Cambyses by sending him mad. But Herodotus said that he must have been mad to even try and kill Apis, the bull god. After that incident, Cambyses became even crueler and even crazier. For example, he ordered his soldiers to take the mummy of the pharaoh Amasis out of his tomb. They tried to break the mummy, but it was too strong, so they burnt it. In another incident, he shot the son of one of his courtiers with an arrow, just for fun. Everyone was terrified of the Mad King and very few people tried to advise him to calm down. The first who attempted this feat was his sister. One day at dinner, she peeled all the leaves off a lettuce and sat staring at the bald husk. Cambyses asked her why she was not eating and she said, This lettuce resembles our family. You've torn off all the leaves and made it bare. Cambyses flew into a rage and killed his sister. The next person who tried to calm him down with wise words was Croesus. 
He had formerly been the wealthy king of Lydia. Cyrus had conquered him, but kept him on as an adviser who travelled with the court wherever it went, even as far as Egypt. Croesus said, Your Majesty, I promised your father that I would always give you good advice, even words that you do not want to hear. Your behaviour is becoming more and more wild, and you are killing innocent people, Persians and members of your own family. No good will come of this. You must calm your temper. Cambyses was anything but calm and ordered Croesus to be executed. But the guards realised that he would change his mind later, so they just hid Croesus in the meantime. Herodotus concludes... I say it is proven that Cambyses was quite insane, or he would never have mocked the Egyptians' religion and custom. People naturally believe that their own customs are the best, but they should respect the customs of others. He goes on to claim that some people bury their dead parents and others eat them. Nothing could make those people swap their customs, and they would be horrified if you asked them to do so. We must do what we do, but at the same time respect what other people do. That is why Herodotus thought Cambyses was insane, mainly because he failed to appreciate the ancient land of Egypt and its customs. The Egyptians did strange things like worshipping bulls and making their dead pharaohs into mummies, and Cambyses could not respect the way they did that. So I hope you found these stories about Cambyses.